But speaking about the chapels, elders, we decided to call a church fast. Do you remember those things? You remember church fast, huh? Well, we're calling one. Only for three days. And you all said, praise Jesus for that. We're going to call a fast from Monday the 24th of April to Wednesday the 26th of April. And then in the afternoon of the 27th, which is a public holiday, thank you, Lord, we're having a picnic across at the chapel at 1.30 to celebrate the end of our fast, but also to put some uh, time on the land. I think it's important that we go and we, we start to claim that land. We start to put our feet on it. And so we're going to have um, a chapel a picnic on Thursday the 27th at 1.30. A fast is biblical. And uh, we see many people in the Bible fasting for different reasons in different ways. And the purpose of a fast is not to twist God's arm. You know that, eh? It's a, a fast is not to twist God's arm, but rather to stop something or do less of something in order to spend that time in His presence. So that's what a fast does. You do a fast to remind you, number one, ooh, time to spend a, a, a time with the Lord. Uh, or to reduce doing something or to stop something altogether for that time of the fast. And so we're asking you to fast 26th, 27th, and 28th. And we're using the fast for those three days actually to pray for Grace Hill. Um, so on Monday the 26th, we'd like to pray for the finances to purchase a crossroad. We've still got some ways to go. So just to give you an update on that, we approximately raised about 600 and. 40,000, so we need about 2.8 million. Now, I know some of you have got a lot of that under your mattress. Bring it out. Do not lie on it. No. We need about 2.8. We want to pray that God would provide the finances for next door. We need it by the end of the year. So that's day one. Monday the 26th, we're going to pray for the finances of the, to purchase the chapel. Huh? What did I say? Yeah, Monday the 26th. Right, that Monday. <laughs> that Monday, that's what we're praying for. Next Monday. Not tomorrow, next Monday. The 24th. Why have I got 26 here? Okay, I was looking at the wrong month maybe. Tuesday. We're going to pray for God to use us for the extension of His kingdom. By us, I mean, we know you and I as individuals, but by us, I mean, focus on us as a church community. We want God to use us as a community to extend His kingdom. That's for Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, to actually pray for Grace Hill that we would be a haven, a beacon, a resting place, a place of prayer, a place of hope, a place of peace where people can come to experience the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God. Now, if you didn't all get that in your notes, don't stress the home groups are going to get all these notes. We're going to disseminate it. And, um, and so don't stress about it. I forgot what to pray for again. We're going to help you with that. But those three days we want to set aside. And then on the public holiday, we're going to celebrate together with a picnic starting at 1.30. You bring your own chair, your own table, and your own picnic. Okay, you bring it all yourself and then you take it across the road, although we've got one or two surprises for you, so be there. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But you bring your own table, your own chair, and your own picnic basket. Okay. So having spoken about why of our church fast, the next question is what do I fast? And uh, as I said earlier, there are many examples in the Bible of fasting, I went and I had to look it up. I had a few, but I actually had to go and look it up in my notes from way back when. There are nine fasts in the Bible. The Ezra fast, the Samuel fast, the Elijah fast, the widow's fast, the Paul fast, John the Baptist fast, the Esther fast, the Daniel fast, and the Jesus fast. Hey, how's that? Did you know that? That's a Wikipedia thing. I didn't look it up on Wikipedia, by the way, just to tell you. All of them were different fasts for different things. And so what I'm asking you to do for our church fast is to fast something very specific. Not food, not media. I want you to fast something, every single one of us, where you think, whether you think so or not, can't bear to be without. You're guessing right now. 
but it's something that interferes with our relationship with God and our closeness to Jesus, and it clenches, clenches, it clenches as well, but it quenches the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's busyness. Now, before you say, Brad, sorry for you, but I'm not busy because I do nothing all day, I'm going to set you free, brother. You are busy. You're busy doing nothing. For our church fast, I'm asking you to set aside half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening to read the Word and pray. And in your reading of the Word and praying, if the Lord gives you a scripture, the Word for the church, please send it, bring it to myself, to Dave, or to Keith, or your home group leader, and they'll send it on to us. And also to help you with your reading and praying, we're going to send some stuff out to the home groups this week, and, uh, and you can follow those. But hint, hint, if you're not part of a group, groups, home groups, Find a, a group there that's maybe close to you or you recognize a person. Take a selfie with it and then phone them and say, can I be part of your group? They will put you on a list and they will send it out via WhatsApp. We communicate via WhatsApp. And so they will also send those details out. You must ask why busyness. I really feel, I, I was praying about this fast. I really feel the Lord said, we need to all fast busyness together. And I'll tell you why. Busyness has become an integral part of our culture. In fact, we've taken busyness to a whole new level because we believe it's part of life. God never intended that for you and I. Never. And so for all you busy people out there, uh, busy people out there, is three days of fasting busyness going to change your busyness habit or busyness lifestyle? Probably not. But I'm hoping that fasting busyness for three days is going to give you a taste of what God intended for you and I. And maybe it's going to play on your mind so much that you're going to make some changes. Listen, this sermon's for me as much as it is for you. When I was in the corporate world, our company decided to take all the leaders and do a psych and medical evaluation so that they can improve our leadership ability. And uh, they want to determine the health of the company by determining the health of its leaders. Makes sense. And so mine came back, and Dr. Numzan called me in, and he sat me down. He said, Brad, I've got the summary of your psych and medical evaluation, and uh, I've got to tell you, if you continue working like you do at that pace and the lifestyle you live, you're going to be dead in 10 years. And I walked outside, I said, yes. My mate was there, we half fought. I said, Bru, can you believe it? I'm working so hard, I'm going to be dead in 10 years. I wore it like a badge of honor. That is nuts. That is stupid. That kind of thinking is so far from the Bible. But hear me this morning, work's good. Work is biblical, work is God-honoring. But overwork is not good, it's not biblical, and it's not God-honoring. And before you judge me too harshly, that diagnosis was made when I was 31 years old. And yes, I'm much older than that today. And it's not due to the marvels of modern medicine. How come? Was the doctor's diagnosis wrong? Nope. It was spot on. But I was forced to make some changes in my life. Some were made for me, and some I made myself. A recent study showed that those who work 11-hour days, get this, are 250% more likely to become depressed than those who work an 8-hour day. And there's a scientific reason for that. Because when you work under stress, your body releases an amount of chemicals and hormones to deal with that, and it's fine, normally. But when you work too much, when you overwork... Science tells us those very same chemicals and hormones your body produces poisons your body. Leads you to more anxiety and depression. Healthcare profession, uh, professionals say overwork more often than not is a factor in the most common medical ailments in our society. Including heart disease, lung ailments, cancer, accidental injuries, cirrhos uh, cirrhosis of the liver to name a few. But there's a reason many of us are driven to overwork. Obvious reason we want to provide. 
I understand that. We want to provide ourselves and our loved ones. And there are privileges that we enjoy when we work. And they are normally in direct proportion to how hard we work. I understand that. And work very often is how we establish our identity. We think the nature of our work determines our worth. Listen, it's the second question we ask people when we meet them for the first time. Question number one, what's your name? Question number two, what do you do? I don't know, do you do that? I do that all the time. Sometimes we're driven to overwork because you're trying to please people. Now I know, you fellow A-typers, <laughs> you don't want to let people down. You want to live up to expectations. You've got to answer that email, have to. Return the phone call. I want to tell you, when you overwork, your phone is attached to you like an IV drip. And by the way, I checked some of you, checked six times on your phone during worship. Come on, it's like an IV drip with us. The bottom line for all these reasons, we are a culture of tired, exhausted people, anxious and stressed, and our relationship with Jesus is strained because of it. May I, can, may I be bold to add, that when we are overworked, Jesus becomes the fixer-upper rather than our Lord and Savior. Won't you turn with me? Oh, you said thank goodness for that. Won't you turn with me to Matthew eleven twenty-eight? Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Oops. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you more strength and capacity to work harder and longer. No, that's not what Jesus said. But that's how we read it. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Dallas Willard said that for most of us we jump into the busy part of Christianity with everything we've got. Serve your neighbor, get active in the church, get busy with spiritual disciplines, but we skip the rest part which is crucial to do the first part. Until you and I learn to rest in Christ, all of our work for Christ is going to be off center. A quick aside. In the Old Testament, we learn of the Sabbath. And Moses and Joshua instituted the Sabbath not, not to provide rest, but to point to Jesus who would provide the ultimate rest. That's what the Sabbath was pointing to. Resting in Christ. And so this morning I want to give you three ways Christ becomes our rest. Three things that if you can say them about Christ from your heart, then you've entered His rest. Number one, Christ is our righteousness. You know, there are a lot of things we cooperate with God on, lots. But our salvation is not one of them. Jesus didn't give an instruction manual and an explanation. This is how you save yourself. He didn't do that. He did the work and told us, believe in it. At the cross, Jesus says, it's finished. Not, I've got you started, now you do the rest. That's not what he said. Having said that, I know Hebrews 4, 9 to 11, is going to throw a cat amongst the pigeons. Don't let it. Let me read it for you. So there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. See, the rest still waiting. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter, enter that rest. Let us do our best to enter that rest. This doesn't mean we cease to do good works. It's not what it's saying. We cease to do them as a way of obtaining salvation. Belief obtains salvation, not work. And gives us a rest in them because we're no longer doing it because we have to have this pressure, the more I do for God, the happier He is with me. You need a rest from that. Leads me to my second point. Christ is our identity. 
through salvation, Christ has given us a new identity. We're no longer strangers or orphans. In fact, the Bible tells us we're sons and daughters of the Most High. You and I are sons and daughters of God. It goes even further to say we're friends of Christ. And we've got gifts to exercise in His kingdom. We don't need to overwork to gain an identity. We've been given one through Christ. Here's my question. Are you satisfied with your identity in Christ? Why do we work to get an identity? See, sometimes it's not enough to have an identity to Christ. We need an identity from the world too. I want an identity that's shaped by the world. When our work and the world around us shape, uh, shapes our identity, you will work even when you're resting. But when Christ shapes your identity, you will rest even when you're working. And you see a little switch there. Leads me to my last point. Christ is our security. Now you, you might recall the Old Testament God said to the Israelites that when it came to, to rest one day in the week, He said, I rescued you when you were helpless slaves. Surely I'll take care of you as my, my beloved people. Reflect on that and take a day off. That was the Sabbath. Reflecting that God had done it. Rest one day because I've done it for you. Just rest on that day. Don't have to worry about that day of rest. And then in the early church, they shifted the Sabbath to a Sunday and they called it the Lord's Day because the Sunday was the day Jesus was resurrected. That's the reason we have a Sunday. They felt it was the best day to commemorate their salvation. Jesus rose from the dead. And on that day, I believe, today, Sundays, it's given us time. We need to reflect on Sundays. If God did not spare His own Son to save us, now that we are His children, will He not freely give us all things? So you've got to rest in that. And so the Sabbath was fulfilled in Christ. Christ my righteousness, Christ my identity, and Christ my security. But just because Christ, uh, the Sabbath was fulfilled in Christ, it doesn't mean we stop practicing the principle of the Sabbath. There's a principle in the Sabbath. It means rest in Him. Can I encourage you? Go further than resting for two hours on a Sunday. I want to encourage you this morning. Go further than that. Set a psalm. Uh, set a psalm. Set a psalm each day. Set aside time each day. Unplug. Pause what you're doing. This means doing a quiet time at the beginning of the day. I know I go on and on about this, but I'm going to throw down the gauntlet this morning. If you're struggling to set aside 30 minutes each morning for reading your Bible and praying and reflecting on God, you have a bigger problem with busyness than you, really, than you realize. I had to get to that place. You and I were never meant to be a people who found ways to fit God into our day. God is our day. I want to encourage you this morning, change that. I will guarantee you, you'll never live life the same again. How's this little known fact? I found this. Really appealed to me. A recent study found that a 30 minute nap, three times a week, cuts your heart attack risk by 40%. Other studies have shown that people who nap are actually more productive. Hey, right now you're high fiving me and saying, I love this sermon. Christ my righteousness, Christ my identity, and Christ my security is what Jesus was talking about. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. But there was a second part to that scripture. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Really? A burden is light? <laughs> and a yoke? Do you know what a yoke is? They attached it to you so you could work hard. Cattle had a yoke on them. Burden is light. Isn't that heavy? Jesus offering the weariness of a yoke. A yoke was given, was put on oxen so that they could plow. It sounds like what tired workers need, ne? Instead of a yoke, can we not have a mattress? I mean, come on. See, but Jesus is not offering an escape from life. He's offering a way through life. And there's a big difference. 
a way through life with the responsibilities we still have. Instead of offering us an escape from pressure, he offers us new ways to release the pressure. When you are yoked up with someone, do you know who bears the most weight? The stronger one. Come on, you know, oh, I've got to tell you, these stages, they're as heavy as anything. And, uh, and so we had to lift it onto Jason's bucky. And so the two young guys, Jason and Regan, were lifting it. And I just had my fingers there. I was like, oh, this is so easy. Why? Because the stronger guys were doing all the work. Here's something to consider. The kind of rest Christ offers is only available for the fully committed. And I'll tell you why. Because a yoke ties oxen together. Literally, they are joined at the shoulder. A yoke joins oxen together. You know, the hardest way to live for most religious people is instead of surrendering fully to Jesus, they adopt a checklist so that God can be happy with them. Throw away the checklist. Throw it away. Put on the yoke. You know that you're not getting the benefit of rest that comes from fully committed because you end up pulling the heaviest part. But when you are yoked with Christ, He ends up pulling the heaviest part. If you and I want to rest fully in Him, then we need to surrender fully to Him. That means taking our busyness, laying it down, picking up His yoke and putting it on us. I love that scripture. I wonder if we can stand. So our fast is over busyness. And I'm asking that you'll set aside an hour a day, half an hour in the morning, half an hour at night. And right now you're probably saying there's no ways I can do that. I'm going to ask you to do it. I ask you to make a plan. And if after three days you think, whew, thank goodness that's over, that's fine. But I'm trusting that God is going to do something. Busyness distracts us from the things of God. Oh, the devil's attacking me in more ways than you realize. But sometimes it's because we think we're doing good. But we're not. We're actually getting distracted. And so, Father, I pray this morning as we go and we prepare for this time of fasting as a church, Father, I pray your Spirit would reveal to us those areas that we can lay aside, those areas that we can lay down to spend time with you. And I pray, Father, that as we lay those things down before you, that your Spirit would come and wash over us afresh. I pray, Father, for incredible times of closeness with you. Incredible times of being in your presence. And I pray, Father, that as we lay those things down, come to a realization of what we can do without when we're in your presence. Now, Father, would you help us? Give us courage and strength to lay those things down, Lord. I pray, Father, that as we set time aside to be with you, you would speak to us pray, Lord, that you would energize us in those times and your spirit would be full to overflowing within us, we pray. Thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word that is true. I pray, Father, that your word falls on fertile soil. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.